31 Thoughts, the podcast brought to you by GMC, Sierra Trucks, and Elliot. It is a real pleasure to be sitting across from a smiling and happy and healthy <laughs> Eddie Olchuk. Uh, the book is called Beating the Odds in Hockey and in Life. Uh, Pat Foley with the forward. It's great to see you. Hey, it Jeff. really is great to see you, Eddie. Eddie, how you doing, man? Thanks, doing thanks well. for having me. Appreciate well, it. Well, first of all, we should also mention Perry Lefko. Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. Who put the book together. Yeah. And uh, known Perry a long time from my days with the Leafs back in the late 80s. And, of course, Perry, award-winning uh, writer for horse racing. So there's, there's, the, there's the tie-in. <laughs> right? you, don't, you don't know him from when you played with the Leafs and he was in Toronto. You guys you know mean? each other from the racetrack. He was always asking me for an, a stick, an autographed stick as a, as a uh, young kid growing up. So I, uh, I obliged and... Here we are writing a book together. So, yeah, I'm really uh, – thanks for having me and, and uh, just really thrilled with how it's kind of been received and uh, it's probably going to be the only book I ever do. And uh, the one th- compliment that I've gotten on the book is I've been – I was very open yeah. Yeah, through the whole – through everything, not only my cancer battle, but also through, you know, just the – trials and tribulations I had as a young kid trying to make it to the greatest league in the world and yeah. was able to do that as a player, as a coach, and uh, now as a broadcaster. How tough was it to relive a lot of what you wrote hard. about? Yeah, it was hard. Um, you know, I think the one thing, Jeff, for me, the reflection that I was able to have of going through the book, I think it was uh, writing the book, was very therapeutic when I was going through, and the heart of this was written when I was going through my cancer battle back in August of uh, 2017, and then taking the chemo treatments until February 21st at 9:02 a.m. When the last time I got on, I got unhooked with my chemo. Um, it took me back. Uh, I was very much at peace when I was going through the chemo. I mean, I was scared. I'm still scared. Cancer's always going to be with Eddie Olchek and his family. But I was very much at peace. And what I mean by that is that you know the, the most important people in my life have always known how I felt about them, and that helped me get through. And if uh, if they came to me and said, "Okay, your time is up. Uh, you've been here uh, 51 plus years. Uh, you lived a hell of a life. Uh, it's time to go." Uh, at least my wife, my kids, my family, my everybody has a circle. My circle, everybody knew how I felt about them, and that helped me get through. And I tell people, I hope you laugh, and I hope you love a little bit more after reading the book. You know. There's an old saying, uh, we each get two lives, one when we're born and the second when we realize we only have one. Mm -hmm. What did you realize about yourself through all of this? That I was in a really good place before I got sick. And I think that's the best way to say it, Jeff, really. I look, I was scared. I mean, all of a sudden one day I couldn't, I couldn't take a crap. I mean, that's just flat out. I couldn't go to the bathroom. Yeah. And 48 hours later, they're telling me I have a mass in my colon and we have to go get it. And we're going to have to take out 14 inches of your colon and hopefully reconnect the plumbing on the inside. We're going to take this mass and tell you what it is. Um, So for me, it was going from being healthy and happy and on my way to a horse racing event for NBC (laughs) down in the States to being in a hospital and uh, getting driven in an ambulance uh, from the suburbs of Chicago down to Northwestern Hospital and uh, having the biggest challenge of my life. So I, I just really believe is that I had a time to reflect. And when you're sick, you ha- I had enough quiet time to last me a lifetime. And I know we, we talked about this when I was going through my battle is, you know, you just you, you go through the days and you're taking 48 hours of chemo and you're just wondering, okay, like, I want I want the Cliff Notes version of this. Let's let's get to the six months and let's let's get on and give me the you know no yeah. no bullshit. Like just tell me, tell me, tell me what I need to know, not what I want to hear. And that helped me get through. And and the other thing too, Jeff is, I had a chance to reflect, and I'm even more, I don't know, more happy is the right verbiage, but I'm I'm more proud and happy of what I've been able to accomplish as a hockey player. Uh, as a guy in our game, and most importantly, my family, than I was before I got sick. Because of all that time, I had the chance to reflect. And I don't think I realized how good of a career that I had until I was going through my cancer battle. Because like I said, I had enough time to think about a lot of things. And um, I think I walk. I, I think I walk a little bit more proudly now. And I don't look at things any differently. I mean, that's the one thing people ask me is like, do you look at life differently? And you know what? I don't. I, I really don't. I, and I say that in all due respect. Um, I just was in a really good place before I got sick. And what it reassured me is that I was. 
And then I had a chance to look back at my career and go, you know what, 16 years in a show, uh, playing in the Olympics when I was 17, drafted by my hometown team, the Blackhawks, being a very small part of a team that won the Cup in New York in 1994, playing my last game as a Blackhawk, uh, and a lot of games in between and some incredible stops. Mm -hmm. Toronto, where I really became a player in the league, I got an opportunity to play and play a lot. I went to Winnipeg, not once but twice. And how I became a Winnipeg Jet is a big part of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, going to New York, having a cup of coffee in L.A., being in Pittsburgh, and then opening up the door to become a broadcaster and eventually coaching, and, and here we are today. That's why it's so interesting to me for me to hear that you were nervous writing about all this stuff because you speak about it so eloquently. And it's not just here on this podcast, mm -hmm. but it's also, I remember last year, uh, Glenn Healy honored you with yeah. the uh, Man of the Year Award for the NHL Alumni. And I was there that night and you gave a really passionate, stirring mm -hmm. speech. And it's always the thing I remember about you in this, Ed, when you know, you told your wife at one point, I don't know if I'm going right. to make this. Treatment too. And what did she tell you? Yeah. Yeah, it was one of those where the the the, the chemo broke me down. Uh, it gives you, it gave me horrendous side effects, talking to a lot of cancer patients and people that are in the battle, have been in the battle. If we talk a lot about that, and they really understand. I mean, for me, it was severe headaches. I had bad nosebleeds. I developed a blood clot. Um, had neuropathy where you just start losing feeling in your fingers and your feet because of the medicine. And for me, I would just go to the bathroom. Like I would just go number two without even being able to control it. And I, and I told my wife, I'm done. I quit. Now this is treatment too. This is September 15th at about five o'clock central time in Chicago back in 2017. And I said, I'm done. I quit. I, I am, I'm hooked up to a port. I got a fanny pack. It's hooked up in my chest and this pump is going off every 90 seconds, just going, and that's all I hear. Like, I, I could have a hockey game on. My wife could be yelling at me. <laughs> the dogs could be barking. And all I hear is that. Pff, and the side effect just broke me down. It, it, it tests your will to live. And I told my wife, I'm done. I'm done. I quit. And I've never quit at anything in my life, ever. Whether I was playing, coaching, at the racetrack, down 25 bucks. All right, scratch that. I'm down <laughs> 2,500. I'm not quitting. <laughs> I'm not bailing. But I, it brought me to my knees, and my wife grabbed me, my wife Diana, and grabbed me, and she just said, look, you got to fight. And it was probably the greatest inspirational speech I ever had. you got to fight for me. you got to fight for our kids. And I lost it when she said, you got to fight for all the people that love you. And I cried. We had a moment which seemed the last probably 10 minutes, but it seemed like an hour. And I was like, okay, I needed that. I needed that caretaker or caregiver to grab me and set me straight. And I cried a little more. I said, okay, I'm going to put my hockey helmet back on and I'm going to go one day at a time. I got my calendar out and I said, okay, I'm going to start setting goals for myself, which I did my whole life. Okay, I'm going to get back to work here. Uh, you know, it's Breeders' Cup in early November. Uh, you know, the Super Bowl's right around the corner. Uh, my daughter's graduating from Alabama. Um, so I just started setting goals for myself, and it helped me get back on track. And that's what I encourage anybody out there that's going through a difficult time or in the battle uh, is to set goals for yourself. Because like I said earlier, you, you want the Cliff Notes version, and you want to just get from treatment one to treatment nine. Um, but I needed Eddie. I needed my wife Diana to, to straighten me up. And something we've taken a, a big... Uh, talking about, too, is the caretakers and caregivers. They're going through a lot as well. Yes. They're not maybe the physical part, but they're going through a whole lot mentally. And uh, I never saw my wife weak. I never saw her down. I never saw her worried around me. Uh, and that goes for my kids uh, who weren't around a lot because they were all out doing their things. But my folks, my brothers, uh, my family, uh, the Blackhawks, who I do games for, and them and their support and all my friends throughout the National Hockey League, um, we got to make sure that as a society we're looking after the caretakers and caregivers because they're going through a lot too. My wife was never weak around me or down, but I know when she wasn't around me, she would let her guard down and wonder, well, what the hell is going to happen to him? So we got to make sure we're checking up on those people as well because uh, they're going through a lot. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about Diana, who I've yeah. never met. 
uh, because she had surgery around the same time too, right? She had back surgery, right. correct? Yeah. So think about it. You yeah, guys she had a spinal fusion. At that so time. the yeah. two of you are going through, you yeah. know, big medical conditions yourself. And as you mentioned, she's pulling you through this. Yeah. And I don't want to ruin the story, but we've told that story on the podcast before about how you got traded to Winnipeg, and yeah. it's a dynamite story. <laughs> but like, just tell me about Diana Olchik because you're on the road a lot. You always have been. You've got three great kids. Uh, um, you know, like. Uh, you know, tell us where you guys met yeah. and uh, about the relationship between you. Well, we met my rookie year in the National Hockey League, believe it or not, and she was a flight attendant mm-hmm. uh, on American Airlines. And at that time, teams, at least in Chicago, we weren't chartering. So uh, this is like January of 1985. Mm-hmm. And we happened to have an afternoon game in Chicago that day. Uh, so after the game, we were on our way to fly to New York to play the next night. So we're, I'm driving to O'Hare, and there's a massive accident in between downtown Chicago and O'Hare Airport, which is only about maybe 17 miles. Mm-hmm. And it's brutal. And I'm like, I'm a rookie in the NHL. I better be making this flight because I don't need to be hearing it from the team. Forget any fine or whatever. You you miss, you're late or whatever as a rookie, you're in big trouble. So I'm like, I must have probably broke maybe four laws, or okay, 14 <laughs> laws to get there to make this flight. I made it. And half the team missed the plane. Mm-hmm. And I walked on this plane, and Diana Vickers, my wife's maiden name, uh, I walked on this plane, and she was taking the boarding passes. And she wasn't even supposed to work this flight because she was living in New York. They just called her from New York to fly in that morning. She deadheaded to work that flight just to go back to New York. And I got on that plane, and I'm like, okay. I saw her name tag was Diana. That's my mom's name. Mm. Her maiden name is Vickers. I grew up on the street Mick Vickers for like 19 years of my life. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is just like, would you like to get married? I mean, just like <laughs> my dad's an Eddie. I'm an Eddie. I'm like, wow, this is perfect, right? So uh, was an open flight, and I negotiated myself into an open section. It just happened to be the section she was working in. So she said I ordered maybe like 15 orange juices that day, just, you know, that day. So that's how we met. We met on an airplane. So I asked her if she wanted to go to the Ranger game the next night. She said she did. I left her two tickets at at, uh, the box office at Madison Square Garden. And I said, look, I'll meet you at the box office after the game. We win the game. Bob Murray scores in overtime. General manager of the Ducks. Murph scores in overtime. We win 6-5. We beat the Rangers. It's pouring rain that night. I'm lapping Madison Square Garden trying to find this, this young lady, Diana. And she's not there. I'm like, wow, she gave me the nine of hearts. Like this, you know, (laughs) it cost me 142 bucks for the tickets. I'm like, wow, that's it. So I call her apartment or whatever. And on the other line, when I, that night, I just, I'd call up. And the first time I'd called her and all of a sudden I hear, hello. I'm like, some guy answers the phone. I'm like, you know, I'm a little taken (laughs) back by that. Uh, Is Diana home? No, I think she went on a trip or whatever. So I just took it as she left for a trip and had to go working. So, so we ended up hooking up some, I don't know, maybe seven weeks later, she actually found out where I was staying in Vancouver, believe it or not in Vancouver. And I got back late that night. So on the East coast, it's already one o'clock. It's 10 o'clock in Vancouver. And I have a, the light is blinking on the message and on the phone. So I asked the uh, operator, I have a message. She goes, yeah, I have a message from a Diana Vickers. I'm like, oh, shit, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm looking for a pen. I'm looking for a piece of paper. She, I'm like, where's your pen? Where's your paper? She goes, sir, relax. I go, you have no pen and paper. Her hold like I thought she was going to lose the number, right? So I go, hold on a second. So I just improvised. I went into the bathroom. I grabbed a bar of soap, and I just wrote her number <laughs> up on the on the mirror in the room there. Uh, long story short, we, uh, we ended up hooking up a couple of weeks later in Chicago, had our first date. And the next night I happened to score two goals in my very first playoff game against the Detroit Red Wings. So E that $142 probably turned into about 14 million. So I'm just, I'm just telling you. I, I just have to say, Jeff, the most incredible thing about this story, which is a great story yeah. is you went on a date the night before your first playoff game. Well, I mean, we had curfew and, you know, <laughs> went for a nice dinner and, you know, got a kiss on the cheek and kiss for luck. And it was good luck. On, and we're on our way. And I scored two goals against the Detroit Red Wings in my very first playoff game. So I said, you know what? Better marry this girl. <laughs> and we did. I, I'm, I'm curious, Eddie, what did you learn about her through your cancer? You mentioned, you know, you never saw her any signs of weakness. Um, you never saw her, you know, soften at all. Down, very yeah, positive. Yeah. But. What did you learn about your wife as a person? Uh, 
I think I learned that she wasn't going to stand next to me in my battle. She was going to stand right in front of me and be the one to take me by the hand and help me get through this and understand that I was at my weakest she's probably ever seen me in my life. Because Jeff, when you when you're when you're sick like that, you feel like you've let everybody down. You feel less. You feel weak. You feel, um, you know, you just you just you, you you can't comprehend it, and you you feel like you're worrying everybody. And I think for her, uh, I always knew that she was strong, and I always knew that she would have be able to to say the right thing um, but I think that, that that strength she showed and delivered to me and to our family at our at our most troublesome time um, just showed the type of, of person that, that she is and, and there's no doubt that she is as a lot of my my former teammates and I say former friends now and tongue in cheek but you know we, we know who is the toughest person in the old check family and 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 uh, i'll be forever grateful for what she was able to do but i I really believe is that she wasn't going to stand behind me or next to me she was going to stand in front of me and and guide me through and and i needed that i want to move on because i I think eddie old life is a lot more than just the last couple of years even though it's an incredible battle that you fought um so i remember jeff in 2012 Stanley Cup final, which was uh, Kings Devils, we go out for dinner uh, one night, and uh, Glenn Healy is still working at Hockey Night in Canada. Then he says, "Ed Olch is going to come with us," and we're like, "Okay, great." And you know, when Glenn comes out for dinner, the Chardonnay is going to flow, <laughs> and that's when I realized, like you, Ed doesn't drink, and you you've never had a drop of alcohol in your life. Correct? Three times. Three times. Three times. Okay. Yeah. When I was seven. Sit in my dad's lap. Yeah. Full, full disclosure. Yeah. Seven, just my dad was drinking. And I tried and I spit it all over him. He didn't like that. <laughs> uh, two is when we won the Stanley Cup. I had the sip from the Stanley Cup in 94. And then uh, my son got married uh, on August the 4th of 2018. Oddly enough, one year to the day that I was diagnosed with cancer. Mm. My son, Eddie, uh, him and Erica, and uh, I drank uh, that night. So only three times. Uh, on purpose that okay. I've ever drank. <laughs> so he, he didn't drink that night and uh, don't smoke. So I, I joked like, what's your vo- your vice? And I like to gamble, but this man <laughs> likes to gamble. And yeah. I know the truth. You love broadcasting hockey, but when NBC puts you on the Kentucky <laughs> Derby or the Preakness yeah. or the Belmont yeah. or, yeah. oh, sorry, what's the big one in the? Royal Ascot. Well, Royal in Ascot. In England, yeah. But, oh, the Breeders' Stakes. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, Breeders yeah, yeah, Breeders' Cup, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that is your yeah. true yeah. love. You love <laughs> the horses. I do. Uh, it is a passion. It's always it's always been a passion. Uh, I thought you were going to ask me about my uh, my uh, fifty to one ticket on the Tennessee Titans to win the Super Bowl. I thought you were going to ask me about that. I didn't there. know. Yeah, I'm glad yeah. you're, you're talking about. <laughs> I this. got them actually in the last, the third, with three weekends left to go in the NFL regular season. I got them at fifty to one. And uh, what did you put down? Uh, a couple bucks. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is I would be able to buy that sweater a couple of times. Let me just tell you that. So. I, I just I just have to say this for the record, okay? Yeah. I, I forgot. I didn't know. I we forgot were... we were doing this, so I would have. I, no, I You're remember. Working we, with I Merrick remember we you were get do, a chance I, to be with me. I, I remember we were doing the interview. I forgot we were doing it on camera, uh, so I didn't shave. And actually, this I, like, a, I like this how is you a look, very though. comfortable sweater. It, 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 however you feel about and it, it's I, very I'll just comfortable. Say this, I know it looks better re- reversed. <laughs> so okay, that's, that's all I gotta say. This, so. this is his. Uh, I'm really, I really want to be in Jasper. <laughs> look. <laughs> Well, you got a couple of hickeys there on your neck there. It looks, you know. yes, it's great. I should say it about the turtleneck, though. If you look at some old video of me when I played for the Leafs, I used to love the turtleneck. You were Placanitz? I loved it. Oh, I loved it. No, well, wait a second. Placanitz is how old? That's true. A little respect, okay? <laughs> Had a couple of good nights with the uh, with the turtleneck, by the way. Any, anytime I see a guy get a five-point game in the NHL now, I'm like, wow, yeah, that's pretty good. Well, it's pretty good when you get the six points. <laughs> I had two six-point games. I don't know if you know that back I in do, the day. I do so, know that. So back in the day. But look, horse racing's always been a passion of mine. It's always been my release. It's always been. Uh, anybody that knows me, um, I've owned horses. 
uh, getting an opportunity to work for NBC and their Triple Crown coverage has been absolutely incredible. I've been there five years now for the for NBC's coverage of the Triple Crown. My first year, yeah, you picked winners. Crown. Triple Crown, yeah. third year, Triple Crown. So I've seen two Triple Crowns in five years where we waited 100 years, 37 years, to see a Triple Crown winner. But uh, it's, like I said, it's uh, it's a passion of mine. It always has been. And uh, I'm uh, very thankful for the opportunity. And uh, it's, it's been a it's, – it's, I think it's helped my hockey. I, I really do. I think it's helped my hockey broadcasting uh, from the aspect of uh, – you know, it, it forces me to do something outside my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So I try to bring some of that, um, what I've learned there, to the hockey broadcast and, uh, you know, get a chance to work with, obviously, Doc Emmerich and Brian Boucher on, uh, on the NHL and NBC and, and do the games down there as well. See, I grew up in uh, the era, Elliot, same, where you know, there's a po point in the 70s where the two biggest sports in the world were horse racing and boxing. Yeah. And they've both taken a knee since. Sure. Where did your love of horse racing come from? The first day I went to the racetrack, when I think I was 12 years old, 13 years old, I went with a uh, a teammate of mine who I eventually went up and played in Stratford. I played junior B hockey Collins, in Stratford, yeah. Ontario with the Collitons. Uh, the late Denny Flanagan, who just passed away some 15 months ago, uh, brought uh, myself, Danny Quillis, uh, the goaltender, Mark LeVar, who played a few years in the National That's Hockey sure. League. Uh, they brought us up to Stratford, but Danny's dad was a big horse player. And uh, when I was 12 or 13, one day, summer hockey or whatever, he's a horse player. We went out to old Arlington Park racetrack and went in there, and I see these un incredible animals just cruising up and down the track at 25, 30 miles an hour, these crazy men and women jumping on the backs of these horses <laughs> going up and down. I was just – I was taken in right from that day. Yeah. And then, you know, you make a couple of wagers and – you lose a couple of times, and then you go back, and you know you you get your money, and then you know you give the the ticket taker your your uh, winning ticket, and he looks at it and he goes, "How old are you?" I go, "Well, you didn't ask me how old I was when I lost. I mean, so <laughs> give me my hundred and eight bucks, and let me be on with this here. Give him a couple bucks for the tip, and he gave me a wink, and I was on my way. So, but but I think it was just the initial beauty that I saw Jeff with horse yeah. racing. So Culleton, so would you? Is that Hold, which one? Which second? Yeah. What's the most you've ever won or lost a day at the track? Well, I mean, I've probably lost a few thousand, a couple thousands. Well, I mean, sometimes you have yeah, a bad yeah. day, hey, right? Sometimes it's good. Sometimes right. it goes. Then, sometimes uh, you catch the bear. Sometimes uh, the yeah, bear catches you. I mean, then you. one day I had a, uh, I had a hundred and sixty-eight dollar investment that turned into a half a schmill. So. Ooh. Oh my God! Yeah, so oh. I got even actually, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> remember what I said about Diana old check? Yeah. I remember. So right, I mean, how many more pairs of black shoes and jeans do you need? Okay, so, is this this isn't live, right? I, do I need to call the well, locksmith or anything? We're gonna, we're gonna edit this. <laughs> yeah. Out. Oh yeah, yeah. sure. sure you are. Uh, we'll clean yeah, this sure. right up. Yeah. Eddie. Yeah. Uh, I did want to ask about the Cultons yeah. since, since you referenced them. Maybe some in some legendary hockey oh, players that have that have gone through Stratford, yeah. as we all know. So that would have been William Allman Arena. Yeah. So that is one of the longest standing and longest continuous serving hockey rinks right. uh, in Canada. I think Galt is the oldest. And I think William Allman uh, is the second. What are your memories of playing there wow. at, that at that time of your life? I remember leaving Chicago as a 15-year-old hockey player going yeah. up to the hockey hotbed of Canada and going into Stratford, Ontario, driving into Stratford from Toronto Population 27,000. I remember that in, that was 81, 82, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, it wasn't 82, 83, 82, okay. 83. And I'm like, all right, well, we got three ugly Americans coming to Canada, <laughs> 27,000 and three. And uh, it ended up being the greatest decision I ever made for my hockey career because I was going up to play against older guys. Yep. Uh, I was just turning 16. And I wanted to play against better competition. And Stratford had a great track record of developing hockey players, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Flanagan. And we went there in the old Midwestern Ontario Junior B League and traveling and going to school and still stay in contact with my billets, uh, Ted and Marion Turford, who were in Stratford. And uh, so it, it was – it was so exciting and exhilarating to go to a place like that and to play in front of 3,000 people every night. And 
uh, to have your own locker room and, you know, to be t- talked about in the newspaper and on the radio. And again, this was all new to me. So that, but I knew that all the eyes were on me. And look, I was going into a league where, you know, we're playing against men. We were going up against 19 and 20 year olds and they want to sit there and grab this American kid that's performing well and setting all kinds of records. And they want to put me into the eighth or 10th row or put me <laughs> into the Stratford river. I mean, that was just the reality of it. Um, but it, Jeff, it really, uh, it put me on the map. And the next year I got drafted uh, second round by Laval of the Quebec uh, major junior league. And of course, Mario was there at that time. Uh, I got drafted in the first round by the Marlies. Uh, the only team I didn't talk to, believe it or not, in the Ontario Hockey League draft. Uh, and also the Portland Winterhawks had my rights out in the West. So it's much different now than it, is, it was back then. Uh, I'll never forget that Claude and Susie Fresnel, who were the owners of the Laval, I think they were the Titans at the time, I think. Yeah. And Mario was there, and they came to Chicago. And uh, they brought in a grocery bag or two when they came and had this visit with us and said, we really like you to come to Laval and play with Mario. Now I always wonder what would have happened if I would have went to Laval and played on a line with Mario as a 16 year old turning 17, you know, how would things have, look, I I don't want to say I was this close, but my first, my first goal was to make the Olympic team the next year. And Mm -hmm. if I didn't make the Olympic team, I still believe to this day as I would have went and played major junior. When I went to Laval, I don't know. What I would have played in the Marlies, I'm not sure. But I, I, I was this close. If I didn't make the U.S. Olympic team the next year after Stratford, there's a pretty good chance that I would not have gone to college and I went and w- wouldn't have played major junior. So having Claude and Susie come to Chicago and try to persuade us, persuade us to go to Laval was something that was taken back. My dad was in a grocery store business for 55 years, and my dad knows what he sees in a – in a grocery bag, whether it's stuffed with groceries or with some change. so <laughs> Or let, a different kind of lettuce. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there, was a, there was a few racks of uh, uh, heads of lettuce in that bag. Was there more or less than what you won in your biggest day at the track? I can't hear you. E, you're breaking up right now. So yeah. No, 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 please. It wasn't even close to that. It wasn't even close to that. You had another one. It looked like you were going for. Well, it. I was just gonna you mention Mario Lemieux, and then I wanted to dovetail into coaching the Penguins. Yeah. 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 How did that experience? Because it's so seldom you can have an experience like that and not learn something profoundly from it. Being around those types of players and those types of people, most notably a rookie Sidney Crosby. Yeah. Well, I mean, remember I had played with Mario. Yeah. I had played with Ronnie Francis. Uh, I had spent some time in the Berg as a player, and then I was as a broadcaster. And then when I went in to see Craig Patrick, the then general manager of the Black uh, the Blackhawks, the Penguins, uh, in 03, the Penguins had not had did not have any coaches in the organization, nobody. Ricky Keogh was stepping down, uh, Craig's brother was stepping down in Wilkes-Barre, and they had nobody in Wheeling at the time. So when I went in, I had made a decision with my wife that I wanted to get into the coaching. And when I went in and had my initial meeting with Craig, the first thing I said is, like, I'd like to apply for the Wilkes-Barre job to go to the American League. And I talked to Craig for about three hours, and I've known Craig since 1984. So, I mean, we've known each other for a long time. Um, and the next call back I got was, is, you know, I'd like to meet again. And the next thing I you know is, would like you to, audition for the, the coaching job of the Penguins. So it went from Wilkes-Barre to the possibility of coaching the Penguins. And I didn't – did I think it could happen? Once I heard what the plan was, yeah, is that we were going to start from scratch and we were going to get rid of salary and pretty good chance there's going to be a work stoppage within one year. We're preparing for four and five years down the road. So that's kind of how that all kind of played out. So I had the relationship there. Um and I got the job, and the first year, I mean, we had some tough times. I mean, I think we went, like, we had Robert Lang, Marty Straka, Yuri Slager. I mean, we started moving everybody out, and we were going to hit rock bottom. And there was a stretch there where we went 17 games without winning, 17 games. But the one thing I say, Paul Maurice paid me this compliment, um, said the teams that, 
he would coach against that I was coaching is that the teams always played hard and there was great structure amongst how they were playing, whether you won or not. And yeah. that was a great compliment that I got from Mo. And when you go that long without winning, you're doing a lot of selling as a coach. Sure. And then we finally won a game in Arizona. Sorry, Brian Boucher, but <laughs> Bush was the guy in goal. Uh, my teammate now at NBC. And uh, we won that game. And in the last 20 games, I think we won like 13 of the last 20 games that year. So that kind of set me up for the, you know, the following year after we won the eventual uh, lottery for, for winning with Sid. So we had Sidney Crosby on the podcast to kick off the season. And I asked him if he, you know, as he looks back sure. at what his career has been, um, if he would have changed anything. And he said, I would have changed how I behaved towards officials mm -hmm. when I first started. He said, uh, you know, he looked back and he says he's a little bit embarrassed at how he behaved and some of the things he said. And he said he spent a lot of time apologizing since. From the coach's bench, yeah. was it as bad as Crosby made it out to be? Um, I don't think it's as bad as perceived. I think that Sid needed to go through the league a couple of times go through some certain situations to be able to learn. I mean, his grasp of the game and to have coached him in his first year and to help him along. I mean, I remember the game vividly and being in Philadelphia. Penguins hadn't won in Philadelphia in like a thousand years. <laughs> yeah. And we were on a power play and Darian Hatcher, I think it was Darian Hatcher, got in Sid's grill and Sid retaliated, took a penalty. We talked to him in the hall. I talked to him in the hallway after the game. Remember Bob Harwood? Yeah. About, oh, right. Yeah, sideline yeah, reporter, reporter yeah. for yeah, yeah sideline reporter. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I call him I call him Billy Softsteel <laughs> instead of Bob Harwood. But <laughs> Billy Softsteel did we did an interview on the bench and he asked me about Sid's penalty and, and I said verbatim is that uh it's been addressed and it won't happen again. And I think Sid had to learn. Because, you know, look at his whole life. I mean, I'm sure he had shadows. I'm sure he was the guy that always was going to be uh, the main point of, of, of focus, and rightfully so. But, um, you know, I think that was just a sign of, uh, of a lack of maturity of getting to the National Hockey League. Yeah. And, but, you know, he, when you would sit down, and t when I would sit down and talk to him or the coaches with Joey Mull and Randy Hillier, um, even before you'd show them a video clip. Now, in those days, we had a VCR and a VHS, you know. We hadn't gotten up to speed with the DVR and the All DVDs. Fancy kids yeah, yeah, now right, exactly. You're... you're trying to hit the thing, the remote, and then you're going up there and you're kicking the side of it because it's stuck. <laughs> Even before you run the clip, Sid would stop it and, or like he just said, yeah, I probably shouldn't have turned away here and just stop. I mean, you know, like he just knew. Mm -hmm. um, his work ethic, second to none, his skating ability, just absolutely just blew the doors off of all of us. Um, but I think there's some validity to that, to, to Jeff, for sure. And I think he just had to to uh, to overcome it and learn. And you know, he had a lot of pressure on him. I mean, the kid had a lot of pressure on him coming to the Pittsburgh. I mean, Mario saved the franchise a couple of times. Uh, gives Sid a primary assist, you know, obviously when he came in there and, uh, you know, in, in the 05-06 uh, season. So here's my last one. Like, I know you love being a broadcaster. Uh -huh but I know you would love to maybe get another shot running a team. You have a son uh -huh. who's a coach now. Uh -huh. Bemidji State. Go Beavers. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, My son, Eddie. Actually. Do you envision a day where you're running a team <laughs> and your son <laughs> is coaching it? Wow. Uh, not that specifically. I think I've always have had that dream to work with my kids in hockey. Um, you know, you mentioned my son, Eddie, he played college hockey and assistant coach at Bemidji State with the men's college team in the, in the States. Uh, my son, Tommy, played in East Coast Hockey League after being at Penn State, and then he played over in France last year. He stopped playing. Uh, my daughter, who is in the advertising in Chicago and in the car business, and my youngest son, Nick, stopped playing hockey, and he's an aspiring broadcaster right now, and he actually does color in the East Coast Hockey League with the Indy Fuel. Really? So, um, Which one of our jobs is he taking? <laughs> you know, Eddie, considering you have that sweater on today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say you. Jeff looks a little too good here. So, um, You know, I've, I've, I've always, yeah, I, I've thought a lot about that to uh, look at. I mean, as an old hockey guy, you know, when you see, when you watch your kids play, you always wondered, like, you know, geez, you know, what did Gordie Howe feel when he had the chance to play with his boys? Um, 
you know, say think I think I think about that type of stuff, not necessarily in that the way that you framed it, but um, I'm very lucky. I, you know, I'm very blessed with with our kids, and that's the most proud I am of anything I've been able to accomplish in my life is my is our four kids, my wife and I's four kids, and um, I mean that would be really special whether it's doing a game and and uh, seeing them coach or you know, work in a game and my son's broadcasting on the other side or, you know, maybe on the same broadcast. I mean, those are the things I kind of thought about. I've never thought about that scenario of you, um, you know, talking about that, you know, possibility with my, my oldest son. Mm -hmm. Last one for me, Eddie, and we thank you so much for being really generous with your time. Mm -hmm. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, the world breaks everybody. And sometimes people find that they have strength where they're broken. How strong do you feel right now after going through everything you've gone through? Mm -hmm. Wow, there's a lot there. Um, I would say, Jeff, is that when I was going through my battle, what to be able, anybody out there that is in that battle or specifically of taking chemo for cancer is that you're way stronger than you ever thought you were and you need to be. I never, look at, I'm full disclosure. Like I, I was a finesse player. I knew where to go to score goals. I played in a tough era to be able to play 16 years in the league. I was not known as a tough guy. I did have, I think, documented 17 career fights and I think pretty much won them all, just for the record. <laughs> not we'll really. the I was a punching bag. Are. I was a punching bag for about 15 of them, but... Um, I think what I proved to myself is I'm way tougher than I ever thought I was. As I go back to that being sick it, it, and taking the chemo, it tests your will to live because there was a time where it broke me and then my wife stepped up and got me back to my feet. Um, but I think now the further I can get away from February 21st of 2018, the better that I feel. Um, I go back every three months for checkups. Uh, I get a scan every year. I'll have a scan coming up in early March, and that'll be a two-year milestone for me. So um, I'm still scared. Full full disclosure, I'm I'm still worried because um, every time I go in for my checkup, it's funny when I go in and see the nurse. Every time I go in to see Dr. Mulcahy, who was my oncologist back in Chicago, the nurse goes, you know, I go in there, like, you know, my, my resting heart rate's like 59. Like, you know, I mean, I'm not saying I'm, I was a great condition athlete. I'm probably in better shape now than I was when I was a player. But when I go in there, you know, I mean, a little excited, you know, you're apprehensive, you're worried. And yeah. the nurse always tells me, oh, geez, your blood pressure's up and your heart rate's up. Well, yeah, what the hell do you expect? I'm coming <laughs> in here. Like, I'm nervous. I'm scared. She goes, oh, yeah, that's probably, yeah, that is why. I, mean, I leave here and I go back to 59, a nice resting heart rate, you know. Um, but I think, Jeff, for me, is I, I, th that, I think I proved to myself is that uh, I'm way tougher than I ever thought I was, and that helped me get through the toughest battle of my life. I don't think that anyone that knows you ever would have doubted you, Eddie. Yeah. Thanks so much for doing Jeff, this. Jeff, thank you. Always great to see you guys. Keep up the great work, E. <laughs> you too, buddy. <laughs> see, see you. Guys.